In this lesson, we want to talk about the unit circle and circular functions. All right, back in our algebra course, we learned how to graph a circle. And we also learned how to work with the equation of a circle. So we have here a unit circle, and the center here is at the origin, and the radius is going to be 1. So the equation for this circle is going to be x squared plus y squared is equal to 1. So again, this has the center at the origin. So there's my center. It's at the origin. It's going to be the point 0, comma 0. And my radius is going to be 1. So that tells me that the distance from the center to any point in that circle is going to be 1 unit. OK, so from the center here to this point here, if I move one unit to the right, this is the point one comma zero. OK, so I've moved just one unit to the right. If I move from the center one unit up, this is the point zero comma one. If I move from the center one unit down, this is the point zero comma negative one. And lastly, if I move from the center one unit to the left, this is going to be the point negative one comma zero. OK, but the main thing to understand is that the distance from the center to any point on that circle is one unit. Now using the unit circle to work with our trigonometric functions will lead to some interesting results that allow us to quickly solve problems as we move forward in trigonometry and also into calculus. So let's just get started here on our unit circle. We have an angle that's in standard position. So basically this is the initial side and this is your terminal side. So your terminal side of this angle theta, okay, is going to lie in quadrant one. And notice we have a little point here and this point is going to be labeled as x comma y, just generically, you could use a comma b or whatever you want. And that point there is going to lie both on the unit circle and on the terminal side of our angle. So if we wanted to find something like sine of theta, so sine of theta, what would this be? Well, we know when we started this course, we had a definition that was y over r, but you could also use opposite over hypotenuse. It doesn't matter, you're gonna get the same thing here. But basically, we know that this guy, right, if we look at this guy from here to here, this has a length of y, right? Because this coordinate is y, this coordinate is zero, right? So this vertical distance here, this vertical distance here is y, right? y minus zero, that's all you're doing. So if I think about this, r, the radius, which is my hypotenuse here, okay, is going to be 1, right? Because we're on the unit circle, the radius is 1. So again, the distance from the center to any point on that circle is 1. So sine of theta is going to be y over r, which is y over 1, which is just y, okay? So sine of this angle theta is just going to be the y coordinate of this point right here, okay? And then the same thing is going to happen when I work with cosine of theta. Remember, this is x over r, or again, you could say adjacent over hypotenuse, okay? And in this case, the length here from right here to right here is going to be x, okay? So it's just x over r, which is x over 1, which is x. So the cosine of theta is just going to be the x coordinate for this point right here. So what we can do is really label this point right here as the cosine of theta, and then the sine of theta. So again, this is your x coordinate, and this is your y coordinate. All right, so let's quickly talk about the concept of circular functions. Basically, all we're going to be doing here is swapping out theta for s. Okay, so how does this work? Well, when we're working with a unit circle, remember that the radius is 1. The formula for our angle theta in radians, remember it comes as theta is equal to s, which is the length of the arc, okay, divided by r, which is your radius. Well, in this case, the r is 1. Okay, the r is 1. So theta will be equal to s. So when we're on the unit circle, our trigonometric functions of our angle theta measured in radians found again by choosing some point x comma y on the unit circle can now be rewritten as functions of the arc length s, some real number. Okay, so when we show it in this way, the functions are known as circular functions. So you'll probably see this in your book. They're going to use this letter s instead of theta, right? So they'll start saying sine of s is equal to y and then cosine, cosine of s is equal to x, and then you can get the rest of them using these, so you could say tangent of s is going to be y over x, and then you can get the rest using the reciprocal identities, right? So the cosecant of s is 1 over y, the secant of s is 1 over x, and the cotangent of s is x over y. All right, so let's talk about how we can set up our unit circle now. So basically, in quadrant one, we're going to rely on these trigonometric function values of special angles, right? We've talked about this before. So we know, and I'm just going to go through a few of these. So the sine of 30 degrees is a half. 
And we know the cosine of 30 degrees is square root of 3 over 2. So let's just take that real quick. Let's go down to a sample unit circle. It's not all filled out, just part of it, so I can show you where things are coming from. And if we look at a 30 degree angle, which is in terms of radians is pi over 6, we see that the x coordinate is a square root of 3 over 2, and the y coordinate is 1 half. Remember, because we're on the unit circle, we have this property. This x coordinate here is the cosine of this angle. You could say it's 30 degrees, or you could say it's pi over 6 radians, whatever you want to use, it doesn't matter. And in this case, the sine here is going to be your y coordinate. So the sine of 30 degrees is 1 half, that's your y coordinate. Again, the cosine of 30 degrees is your x coordinate, it's square root of 3 over 2. Okay, so using the same logic, you can see that if I'm working with a 45 degree angle or pi over 4 radians, this would be my cosine and this would be my sine. Okay, if I'm working with a 60 degree angle or pi over 3 radians, this guy right here, this would be my cosine, the 1 half, and this would be my sine, the square root of 3 over 2. Okay, so the point that's associated with that angle, okay, the x coordinate is the cosine, the y coordinate is the sine. Okay, so very important to remember that. So once we have this guy set up, there's a lot of different tricks or techniques to remember these three different values here. Some people use the hand trick. There's all kinds of stuff out there. I'm going to show you what I learned a long time ago. There's a lot of videos that do it this way as well. What you'd want to do is set up, in each case, a denominator of 2. So a denominator of 2. A denominator of 2. Okay, so that's going to be everywhere. You'll notice you have 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2. That's very easy to remember, okay? Then the next thing you want to do, you'll notice that if you ignore the square root symbol, you start here with 1 and you're counting down, and you start here with 1 and you're counting up. So I'm going to make all the numerators like this. So 1, 2, 3, and then I'm going to go 1, 2, 3. OK, if you get lost about where you want to put the one and start and go down, all you need to do is think about, OK, well, if I'm going from right here to right here, OK, if I'm making a right triangle, this X distance is greater than this Y distance. OK, so that tells me that I would want the three here. And I know it's square root of three, but just just forget about the, the square root symbol for now. I know this would be greater than this. So I would start with the three here or you could say I'd start with a one here. However, you want to remember that you're going to have a one, a two and a three and then a one, a two and a three. OK, so that's a little technique you can use. There are many others that you can go with. Now, once you're finished with that, you want to square root all of the numerators, okay? And if you have the square root of 1, remember that's 1, so you can skip those. So I'm going to have square root of this, square root of this, square root of this, and square root of this, okay? Remember the 1 here and the 1 here, square root of 1 is just 1, so you can just ignore it. Okay, so now we have all of these guys, and you can wrap it in parentheses to make it official if you want, but that's how I get these points there. So now that I have all of these points, what I want to do is reflect across the y-axis to get these points over here. So let me show you this. And basically, if I'm reflecting across the y-axis, think about this for a moment. If I go across the y-axis like this, the y-coordinate is the same. Okay, so you'll notice here you have square root of 3 over 2, and here you have square root of 3 over 2. So that's the same. The x-coordinate is now its opposite, right, because I'm on the opposite side of the y-axis. Over here, x values are negative. Over here, x values are positive. OK, so this is negative one half now instead of one half. This is negative square root of two over two instead of square root of two over two. This is negative square root of three over two instead of square root of three over two. OK, so it's very easy to just reflect these guys across. OK, and I know these lines I'm drawing are not perfectly straight, but just pretend they are. So once you've done that, now you can reflect these guys across the x axis. And you'll have all your points. OK, so now if you think about a point that's up here, if I reflect it, Across the x-axis, the x value will be the same, but the y value will be its opposite. So if I reflect this guy right here, down there, and I know that line's not perfectly straight, but you have 1 half and you have 1 half. So the x value is the same. Then you have square root of 3 over 2, and then the negative square root of 3 over 2. So that's all we're doing here to get these values. Again, if you can just remember these values in the first quadrant, okay, you're going to be good to go. You can use the reflection okay, across the y-axis and then across the x-axis to get all the remaining points. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at just a few examples. So I want to look at the sine of 3 pi over 4. And then I want to look at the cosine of 3 pi over 4. 
And then lastly, I want to look at the tangent of 3 pi over 4. Okay, so we know that we could solve this using methods without the unit circle, right? We already know how to do this. But using the unit circle, it's going to be a little bit quicker. So I'm going to find 3 pi over 4 on my unit circle. So where is that going to be? 3 pi over 4 is going to correspond to a 135 degree angle. So it's this guy right here. And you can see that you have the negative of the square root of 2 over 2. So that's your cosine. Let me write that out. Your cosine of 3 pi over 4 will be equal to the negative of the square root of 2 over 2. And then you have your sine of 3 pi over 4 is equal to the square root of 2 over 2. Okay, so let's copy this real quick. Come back down here. I'm just going to paste this in. So let me just rewrite this. So this would be the square root of 2 over 2. And this guy would be, let me just erase this. I can just drag this over. It's the negative square root of 2 over 2. Okay, so how do I get my tangent here? Well, remember, the tangent is found by taking the sine and dividing it by the cosine. So I would take the square root of 2 over 2 and divide it by this guy. But if I'm dividing fractions, I want to multiply by the reciprocal. So I'm going to flip this guy. I'm going to put the negative out in front. I'm going to flip this guy and put 2 over the square root of 2. And you're going to notice that this will cancel with this. This will cancel with this. And you're left with negative 1. Okay. So my tangent of 3 pi over 4 is negative 1. All right, let's take a look at another example. So suppose we had something like the sine of let's say 13 pi over 6 and let's also do the secant the secant of 13 pi over 6 and let's also do the cosecant the cosecant of 13 pi over 6 okay so if you get an angle that measures that's larger than 360 degrees or 2 pi in terms of radians again what you want to do is find a coterminal angle that's between 0 degrees and 360 degrees or 0 and 2 pi radians. So if I'm working with radians, what I'd want to do, let me just kind of divide this workspace up here. And I'll just move this over for right now. What I want to do is say I have 13 pi over 6 radians. If I subtract 2 pi away, I would get a common denominator. So I'd multiply this by 6 over 6. So this would end up being what? It would end up being 12, 12 over 6, right? 12 over 6 is the same thing as 2. So what I'd have here is pi over 6 radians, okay? So I would look at pi over 6 on my unit circle, and that's going to be right here, okay? So this is pi over 6. Again, if I went one more revolution around, I would end up with an angle that has a measure of 13 pi over 6 radians, or 390 degrees, okay? So my cosine of pi over 6 is going to be the square root of 3 over 2. And then my sine of pi over 6 is going to be 1 half. Okay, so let's go ahead and copy this. And so I'm going to write that the sine of 13 pi over 6 is going to be 1 half. Okay, because it's exactly equal to this here. Then for the secant, it's the reciprocal of my cosine. Okay, so this would be equal to, I would flip this guy, I would have 2 over the square root of 3, okay? You just erase this, you don't need this anymore. And so what I do here is just rationalize the denominator. So times the square root of 3 over the square root of 3. So this would give me 2 times the square root of 3 over 3, okay? Then for my cosecant, I'm going to flip, I'm going to flip my sine, right? So if I flip that, the reciprocal of 1 half is just going to be 2. All right, let's just do one more example. So I'm going to look at the sine of uh, let's do negative 23 pi over 4. Let's also do the cosine of the same guy, negative 23 pi over 4. And let me just kind of move these up and out of the way. And then let's also do the cotangent, okay, the cotangent of let's do negative 23 pi over 4. Okay, so now that we have a negative angle, Remember, if you have a negative angle, you want to do the same thing. You want to find a coterminal angle. In terms of radians, it would be between 0 and 2 pi radians. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add 2 pi radians until I get into that range. So let's go to a fresh sheet and say I have negative 23 pi over 4. If I add 2 pi radians, well, 2 pi to this, again, I want a common denominator. 
So I would multiply this by four over four. So you could say this is eight, okay, eight, and then four down here. Okay, so eight pi over four now. So would this get me where I need to be? No, so I could add another two pi radians. So I could add another eight pi over four. Again, all I'm looking for is for this guy to not be negative, right? It's gotta be between zero and two pi, okay? So if I add eight plus eight, that's 16, that's not gonna get me there. So I need to add another one. So let me kind of scooch this down. So let me add another eight pi over four, and that would get me there, right? So eight plus eight plus eight would be 24. 24 minus 23 would be one, okay? And you can do this with one common denominator and say that you have negative 23 pi, plus, again, 8 plus 8 plus 8 is 24, so this would be 24 pi, all over the common denominator of 4, so this would end up giving me 1 pi, or just pi, over 4 in terms of radians. So this is my coterminal angle, so let's go find that guy. So in the unit circle, if I look at pi over 4 in terms of radians, or 45 degrees in terms of degrees, it's square root of 2 over 2, and then square root of 2 over 2, so that's really easy to remember. So I know the sine of this guy would be the square root of 2, over 2, okay? And the cosine of this guy would be the square root of 2 over 2. Now, what about the cotangent? Remember, the tangent is sine divided by cosine. Well, the cotangent, you flip that, it's the cosine divided by the sine. But in this case, I have the same thing divided by itself either way you go, either for the tangent or for the cotangent. So in each case, this is just going to be equal to 1.